Welcome back to Lecture 24. Today we'll continue talking about the Civil Rights Movement as we move into the 1960s. The 1960s will see a wave of student-led protest movements. Um, we're going to see a younger generation of college-age black and white civil rights advocates conducting a series of so-called direct action campaigns. They're frustrated at the slow pace of significant change in American society regarding race relations. They will therefore take in matters into their own hands. A good example of one of these sort of direct action campaigns will be the so-called sit-in movement, which will evolve in early 1960. Specifically, in February of that year, in Greensboro, North Carolina, we will see several students from North Carolina A&T decide to initiate a peaceful protest against segregation in public places. They will perform a sit-in, which is a non-violent form of protest where you simply stay in one location and, uh, you know, as a, as a way of showing that you should be treated the same as every other citizen. The subject of this first sit-in will be the Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, in which at this restaurant, black patrons were not allowed to sit down and dine. They were only permitted to order food to go and then take it away. These students will work in revolving shifts and they will simply sit at the lunch counter and their goal is to be served like any other patron. Before long, however, news of this protest reaches the ears of the white community. And we will start to see violent recriminations against not only these protesters in North Carolina, but other civil rights advocates around the South. The sit-in movement will quickly spread to other cities such as Nashville, Atlanta, uh, Jackson, Mississippi, and you can see from the photo that I provided for you here that for protesters in many of these areas, they were subject not just to verbal abuse, but to physical abuse by local whites. They were spit upon, they had gum put in their hair, they had cigarette butts put out on them, food, drinks poured on them, all in an attempt by the local white community to incite violence among these protesters. They wanted to trigger a fight with them so that the police would carry the protesters away, thus ending the movement. You can imagine it would have taken an almost inhuman level of patience and strength on the part of these protesters not to fight back. But this is key to understanding the movement. The sit-in movement will begin to develop into an organization that is committed to nonviolent protest. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, will develop in early 1960 as a means for peaceful protest to achieve integration. They will take their cue from other nonviolent protesters around the world, such as uh, Mahatma Gandhi's work in India in achieving independence from Great Britain. And these college-aged uh, black and white members will organize the, a, a number of direct action campaigns around the country to try to accelerate the pace of, of integration. Other civil rights organizers will also focus on the issue of voting rights. A coalition of civil rights groups such as the NAACP, CORE, um, SNCC will become very active in the southern states trying to register rural blacks to vote. Many prospective black voters didn't bother to register because they understood that on election day, once they actually showed up at the polls, that they would simply be turned away by angry and suspicious whites. So what we will see are these groups kind of fanning out throughout the South, in particular during the summer of 1964 in Mississippi, which, which becomes known as Freedom Summer. They're going to come into these communities and part of their focus will be on registering black uh, voters, but they will also participate in other activities for the betterment of the people in these communities. 
for instance, uh, they set up a number of so-called freedom schools to help educate local communities. Uh, they help to build houses for those in need. They set up community centers to aid local black population in finding jobs. They were, they were trying to help out on a number of different fronts. And for their work, these civil rights organizers were the target of violent reprisals at the hands of angry local whites. For example, over the course of just a 10-week project in 1964 in Mississippi, more than 1,000 people were arrested, 80 Freedom Summer workers were beaten, 37 black churches were bombed or burned in the area, 30 black homes or businesses were also destroyed, 4 civil rights workers were killed, 4 people were critically wounded. Unfortunately, this type of vicious violence uh, committed against civil rights uh, uh, workers will only continue over time. We'll see the work of freedom writers, as they become known in 1961, trying to advance integration when it comes to public transportation throughout the country. The so-called freedom rides were organized by several uh, student-led groups such as SNCC and the Congress on Racial Equality, or CORE, and this integrated group of civil rights activists will board buses in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., in May of 1961. And their goal was to continue throughout the Deep South and to make sure that buses coming through that region were all fully integrated. Federal law was already on their side, but there's a difference between a law being on the books and it actually being observed in reality. You can see the route that the so-called Freedom Riders took during their trip in May of 1961. They don't really experience any significant problems until they start to get to South Carolina, and then things start to become especially bloody by the time they get to Anniston, Alabama. There, an angry white mob was waiting in the bus station to set upon these Freedom Riders as soon as they stepped off the bus. The bus driver realized that things were quickly going south, so he decided to just not stop at the station. He uh, eventually pulled out, but the tires on the bus had already been slashed by this angry white mob, and the bus was forced to pull over several miles just outside the city of Anniston. When the bus pulled over, they were not alone. The angry white mob had followed the Freedom Riders and were waiting. They, this, someone pulled out a firebomb and threw it in the bus and then the mob held the doors to the bus closed in the hopes of asphyxiating and potentially killing these civil rights protesters. Fortunately, an undercover police officer happened to come by and managed to disperse the crowd temporarily, open the doors to the bus so that the, um, the patrons on the bus could leave, uh, but then the white mob simply descended upon the Freedom Riders, beating them with baseball bats, uh, iron bars, bicycle chains. The Freedom Riders had anticipated, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately running into this level of violence. So those in need were sent off to the hospital and you have replacements that are sent in. You have a, um, other organizers that are sent in to continue their trip because they intend to get to their destination of uh, New Orleans. We will see further violence in the town of Birmingham and also in Montgomery. Uh, by the time the Freedom Riders uh, managed to get to Jackson, Mississippi, fortunately the direct violence will now come to an end, but only because the Kennedy administration is receiving such bad press about what's going on that uh, the Justice Department steps in and begins to, to protect the Freedom Riders. Keep in mind, for the Kennedy administration, these are hugely embarrassing events covered by the international press. This is at a time when President Kennedy is trying to stop the spread of communism abroad. He's trying to convince other countries that the United States should be a world leader and that they should embrace capitalism and democracy. So when people are reading about the violence that is taking place here in the United States against American citizens, this quite rightly uh, damages the reputation of the United States as the home of the free. 
We'll see more violence associated with integrating higher education in the South. While the NAACP had worked tirelessly for years to achieve victory in the Brown versus Board of Education case, they then began working on integrating colleges and universities throughout the South. The Supreme Court upheld James Meredith's right to be admitted to Ole Miss or the University of Mississippi in Oxford. However, the segregationist governor of that state, Ross Barnett, uh, defied the federal government. Barnett decided to play to his electorate, vowing that his state would not, quote, drink from the cup of genocide, unquote, by allowing integration. Just 10 days before registration for fall semester, uh, the governor had himself appointed as registrar at Ole Miss just so he could personally deny Meredith's admission. The Mississippi State Legislature also passed a law preventing admission to state schools uh, by any individual convicted of a state crime and not pardoned. Well, wouldn't you know it, right after that law was passed, James Meredith was tried in absentia, meaning he wasn't there to defend himself, tried in absentia by a justice of the peace in Jackson and convicted of the crime of false voter registration. These were trumped up charges. These were completely false. But you can see that not only the governor, but the entire group of Mississippi legislators were trying to block his admission to the school. The NAACP and Meredith moved forward anyway, despite death threats and rumors of impending violence. In the end, Robert Kennedy, the brother of President John Kennedy, leading the U.S. Justice Department, were forced to send in deputy federal marshals to the city of Oxford, Oxford Mississippi. They sent in 316 border patrolmen, 97 pres federal prison guards to keep the peace. Still, a mob of over 2,000 angry whites assembled on campus, throwing rocks and bricks, spitting and cursing on federal troops. By morning, two people were dead, 28 marshals had been shot, and 160 people injured, all over whether this gentleman, James Meredith, could simply attend classes. Fortunately, there was no violence associated with the integration of the University of Alabama. However, here we have grandstanding Southern segregationist politicians also using this to try to pander to their voting population. Here we have Alabama Governor George Wallace's famous stand in the schoolhouse door trying to prevent Vivian Malone Jones from registering for classes at that institution. Fortunately, the federal government had a presence there and they physically told and you know escorted the governor to the side so that uh, black students could integrate the University of Alabama. Unfortunately we will see that George Wallace as governor of Alabama was not done inciting race-based violence. We have a turbulent year in 1963. Um, we see that Birmingham, Alabama, the schools are considering integrating classes by that point. The governor will come out strongly against this integration. In fact, he will order that all schools in the city of Birmingham be closed in September of that year just to prevent black and white school children from attending the same school. More ominously, he told a reporter from the New York Times, that in order to stop integration in his state, what was needed were, quote, a few first-class funerals, unquote. Only a week later, a bomb exploded at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, killing four little girls who were attending Sunday school there. Essentially, Governor Wallace was giving segregationists the license to practice destruction, to visit death, even upon innocent individuals who were simply trying to integrate society. And again, from the standpoint of the Kennedy administration, these events were troubling, not just personally, but from the standpoint of Cold War relations. Remember, the following year in 1964 is a presidential election year, so Kennedy is all already thinking about his re-election bid in 1964 and seeing images of police brutality on the streets of Birmingham, fire hoses being turned on protesters, dogs being, police dogs being sicked on protesters. This is not playing well in his campaign for re-election. We'll 
talk more about Kennedy and his reelection bid in part two of this lecture.